Well, good morning. Welcome to Regeneration Church. Uh, so excited to see a full house today. Really glad you guys are here. Thank you for those of you that continue to watch online. We really appreciate it. We are continuing in a series called That's Offensive. And we're just talking about those moments in life when somebody might offend us. I mean, how tragic is that? And what can we do about it? And how does God want us to respond? And how can we, as God's people, bring peace into maybe not a very peaceful situation? So we're going to be talking about that today a little bit. So, well, thanks for coming. Uh, As always, Rachel's going to lead us in worship, so let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for a wonderful time in your house And Lord, we invite you into this place to speak to us, God, for your voice to be heard. And Lord, as we lift our voices, may it honor you. And so Lord, be in this time of worship. May we connect not only with one another, but God with you. So we give you this time. Use it for your kingdom's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Please stand and worship with me. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings As we lift our eyes to a hope beyond All creation waits with an expectation To declare the reign of the Lord our God, yeah We will not be moved when the earth gives way
but the same God, yeah. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Oh, for me, for me. Sing it out. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now, how I need you now, oh, oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness.
every single day. Look 
acknowledge just how amazingly good you are to us. Father, as that song just echoes in this room, Lord, we recognize and realize your loving faithfulness is everlasting. And Lord, there is nothing that we can do that separates us from your love, but yet, God, you contend with us even when we're unfaithful, you are faithful. Even when we wander off, God, you bring us back like the good shepherd And so, Lord, in this moment, I pray that our hearts would be open to hear your word. That, God, as we stare into the mirror of your word, that that we would see the reflection of who we are and recognize where you want to take us. That we would see where we are and how you want to grow us in character as a person to be more like Christ. And so, God, we give you this moment. We pray that you use it to change hearts. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Rachel. You may have a seat. I really appreciate it. Um, A couple things while we do a little reset. We've got uh, um, today is Second Sunday. And what Second Sunday means is we all kind of go out to eat afterwards. And so we will be going out to Cheddar's today. And everyone is welcome to join us. We just Get a big table and have lunch together. It's a chance for us to, outside of, thank you, outside of Sunday morning for us to uh, talk a little bit and get to know one another and just build uh, relationships. So I uh, would love for you guys to be a part of that. So the way it works is after service, we will simply pack everything up and we usually get a uh, show of hands and then we'll send somebody over there to sort of get things moving and then we'll pack everything, put it on the trailer and then we all go. So hopefully you guys will join us and be a part of that second Sunday at Cheddar's. Well, don't forget each and every Sunday it is super important for us as a church that you will connect with us on our connect card. And so you can scan the QR code that's behind me. It's behind me. Uh, I, okay, now that, we've, now that we've got this thing elevated, I hate that I cannot see it in the mirror. I just see me, and I don't care about me. I want to see what's on here, because now I don't know what's behind me. But anyway, I'm just going to trust, sweetie, that you have my back on this, <laughs> so I appreciate it. Um, yeah, well, yeah, if you laugh, right. So um, the Connect card is something that we do it every week, and it's a place that if you just will text the word Connect to our church number, which is 832-703-0033, or you can simply um, just uh, scan this QR code. Either one of those things, that will be a huge help. Uh, you fill out the form and send it in, and that's fantastic. But... Um, it's also a place where you can do your prayer request. There's a little uh, spot at the bottom where you can put your prayer requests. And we also have a prayer line. And so if you text the word prayer to 832-703-0033, then you can also uh, submit your prayer request that way. Because each and every Monday, we pray. And on Monday evenings on Facebook Live, we meet together. Uh, it's really just me. You don't have to, you're at your house. You don't, you don't have to participate other than show up. And, uh, and I'll lead us in a time of prayer. Less about Five, ten minutes, that's about it, but that's on Mondays, so be a part of that. And we are having Bible study this week, right? Uh, yes. Yes, we are. Okay, so Bible study this week. It was off last week because they had something going on at the church, uh, but we're having Bible study this week, Thursday night, 6 o'clock. Be there. It'd be great. Uh, it's at, at uh, Crossroads Church. Yes, just south of I-10 off of West Green. <laughs> All right, so... <laughs> You have no idea the mental gymnastics in my head trying to get that right every time I say it. But anyway, uh, so Bible study is fantastic. Hope you guys will be a part of that. All right. 
Well, so our series called That's Offensive, we're talking about our sensitivity to offense. It's when people hurt us or wound us and we always have to be hurt or wounded. Well, we talked about that last week when we talked about being overly sensitive to people offending us. Well, this week, this sermon's uh, entitled A Family Offense. And, uh, you know, when we originally set out to write this message, it was really about, it was going to be about this, about church, about church family and faith family. Because at least the, the majority of the principals in our church, at least the, the leadership, we've all, all of us to a person have been wounded at some point or another by church, by people in church, where the church experience was not a good one, uh, myself included. We, we've had those experiences and we're like, does, does it have to be that way? And the answer is no, it does not. But as we've gotten into this message and as we've been writing it, everything we talk about in our faith family also applies to our physical family, right? And so we don't need to necessarily draw a hard line between as we talk about church today as well as talking about family today. So as we talk about our familial relationships, we're also talking about our faith relationships. So it's both. Now, I've been in churches where there's been divisions in churches, and I know you have as well. So I've, I've, I, had, <clears throat> I had a lady one time. You know, you ever, you ever know somebody that seems like they're never happy? Don't point at your spouse. Have you, ever, have you ever known someone that's like, they are never happy? You know what I'm talking about? Well, there was a lady in our church, and it was like she, she could find no right, you know what I'm saying? But she could always find what was wrong. And when she found the things that were wrong, she wanted to have a meeting with the pastor. That was me. And, and, and you know... I use the term emotional vampire sometimes, but you know that, that, that person that just sucks the energy out of you and you're like, oh, you're killing me. Um, she was kind of like that because there was always a gripe. There was always a complaint. She was always very unhappy. And I can remember the last time that I met with her and the last time I spoke with her, she had a problem. This was at, uh, it, was, it was Christmas, around Christmas time. And the children's wing of the church had done some decorating. And, you know, they had the typical you know, manger scenes and, you know, kind of stuff like that. But somewhere in there, I'm talking like this big and not in a manger scene. It was just a part of a, a part of a decoration. There was a Santa. And I mean, she lost her mind. How dare we bring this pagan idolism into our church? And I'm like, I, you know, and, and it was a volunteer who was fairly new, you know, to the church, maybe had been a Christian for like six months and was like, it's Christmas. You know, that was about how innocent it was. It wasn't like, we're bringing Satan into the church for Christmas. It wasn't anything like that. But she was certain that we had lost our Christianity and that we were, you know, celebrating. And that, Anyway, so she's like, I need to have a meeting with you. And I'm like, of course. Yeah, of course you do. So let's have a meeting. And I, I want you to know, I love this person. I cared for this person. We have a battery change here because, uh, all right. All right. Thanks, guys. I try. <laughs> All right. So um, I, I loved her. I cared for her. And I wanted to listen to her. But in this last meeting, I finally, I said to her, I said, you know what? It doesn't seem like you're very happy here. And I said, sometimes, sometimes God causes our discomfort so that he might move us to a place where he can better use us. And I'm not asking you to leave the church in any way, shape, or form. But I am asking you to pray about, is this really the place for you? If not, it's because God is wanting to move you to a place where he can better use you. And I'm giving you the freedom to explore that as a possibility. And I never saw her again. <laughs> but here's the thing. She, she confided in a friend of hers who was on staff, and she said, you know, I never felt better about this moment because I really do feel like that God was calling me somewhere else, and I just hadn't been looking. I hadn't been seeing it. And, and so she left. And I was like, amen. That was absolutely perfect. And so there are times when people in church in fights, and I mean, there's fractured churches, and there's churches that split over just really silly things. I know you have had some experiences like that. I had a real big one with the church I grew up in, um, and it started over the youth pastor and the senior pastor and somebody that wanted the job of the youth pastor. And the youth pastor wanted the job of the senior pastor. And so... Um, and that didn't work out. Yeah. So huh. <laughs> the, the person that wanted the job of the youth pastor betrayed the youth pastor's trust, which caused the pastor to fire the youth pastor without confiding in any of the congregation, 
which turned the church into um, a split right down the middle. Everybody with kids on one side, everybody without kids on the other, and everybody's mad at each other, and the church never recovered. Hmm. Man, I'm telling you, what is Satan's plan with the church? Division. What is Satan's plan for your family? It's the same. Division. If Satan can divide you, if Satan can fracture hearts, if, if Satan can fracture relationships. Because let's be honest, God is a God of relationships. Can I say that again? The whole reason why Jesus came is so that God might have a relationship with you and me. That is the entire reason, so that we might be forgiven of our sins and in doing so, reunite us with our loving Heavenly Father who desires nothing else but to have fellowship with his creation. God is a God of relationships, and therefore Satan's attack against God is to separate his people from him. And if he can fracture his church, if he can fracture a faith family, if he can cause discord in this room, if I can be offensive to you and not even know it, but you're offended and you're like, how dare he? And you walk away and you're like, well, church, huh? Then he's won. And if he can cause that in your family, then he has won. And God is a God of unity and God is a God of relationships. And it's, I mean, this is every person that God brings in front of you. It's God's desire that you love that person. We are called to one thing in this life and that is to love people that God puts in front of us. And if we are selfish and unloving, then we are not doing God's work. We're to love God and love people. Those are the greatest commandments. And so we, we pressed into Scripture, and we were looking all around, but we really landed on uh, three verses that I think we're going we're gonna to do an exegetical study, which means we're going to go sort of phrase by phrase and unpack this thing and, and talk about what it looks like. And so it's found in Romans chapter 12, and if, if, you, if you've turned in your, if you did your Connect card, you should get that outline. That's part of it that will email you the outline, so you can jump on your email and you can see it. You'll see it. God willing, on the screen behind me, I don't even know if it's there, but I'm going to trust it's there. So you'll see it on the screen behind me as well. But Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read these three verses, and then we're going to unpack them. So Romans chapter 12, verse 16 says this, be in agreement with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Now listen, we can fly through this list and none of it land. We can read this, all right, be agreeable, don't be proud, do not be wise, and we can run past this whole list as we're reading the Bible, and, but there is, there is a ton of meat on the bone with every single phrase that's in here. So let's take a look. This first part, it says, be in agreement with one another. And so we've got a little, some points that we're going to make. And so the first point I want to make is be agreeable, not argumentative. You, you know somebody who likes to argue? Does anybody here know um, who likes to? Don't be pointing fingers. Four fingers point back at you, David. All right, so, <laughs> <laughs> so the, pre, the person that likes to argue, and we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to argue and stuff like that. But when it says be agreeable and not argumentative, um, really what it's talking about is it's not so much that we can't have discussions about things and different viewpoints. It's not saying that everybody have the same viewpoint because that would be super boring. I mean, nobody that does not create the fabric of family the way that we want to have it. But what it does mean is that when we've decided that this is the direction that we're going, that we all jump on board. We cannot sit in a rowboat and everybody row in the direction they want to go and then make it anywhere. You just can't. So be agreeable means that we're going to be united in purpose and direction and where we're headed. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, Now I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. You know, the, the, the context of this, this passage where he says, be united in what you're saying. It just in this passage in, in chapter 1, uh, some people were saying, hey, I'm with Paul, and others were saying, I'm with Apollos, and others were saying, I'm with Cephas, and so there were all these um, divisions as in, well, Paul didn't say that, so I don't have to do it, and Apollos didn't say that, so I don't have to do it, and Paul's like, would you stop? Seriously? I don't want anybody being like, I, I, I follow Paul. We follow Jesus. That's who we follow, right? Amen. It would be like if in our church, people are like, well, I like when Kevin talks, but I don't like when Quincy talks. I don't want to listen when he's talking. Or I like it when Quincy talks, and so I follow Quincy. I don't follow Kevin. 
And that would be ridiculous. Neither one of us, right, would say we want, right, would Amen. say we want, we want that as a thing. That's not a thing. We are about the Bible and what God is telling us. And we want to do what, what, what God says. And so we're not about division. We want to be united. So first of all, when we say argumentative, we need to clarify. We're not talking about logical arguments. We're not, because, you know, that's how I think. That's how David thinks. We will sit here and argue for hours and hours and then over a steak dinner. What? You know, yes, it's happened plenty of times before. Uh, but that's just, that's different because at the end of the day, we're still working towards the same goal. And that's what it means to be agreeable. Work towards the same goal. Amos chapter three, verse three, it says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so. Think of church like a, or even family, like a three-legged race. Right. If you're not on sync, if you're not working together, if you're not facing the same direction, then what's going to happen? You're going to fall. fall. You're not going to get anywhere. And so when we're working with our church family and our uh, natural families as well, we need to make sure that we're facing the same direction and working towards the same goal. And that goal is Christ. I try to think of church like a living organism. It's walking towards the Lord, and therefore it needs to know where it's going. And disagreements in the church and discord is kind of like a cancer. It comes in and it will destroy the whole organism if you don't nip it in the bud. If you don't stop the disagreements and um, allow that to fester, it will ultimately destroy you and destroy the church and destroy the family. You know, there are some things that are important in the church and we should talk about. You know, what do we build our faith on? And, and if it's something other than Christ, then yeah, we should be talking about that. But there's some other things that aren't really that important. I knew a church that split where they separated in fellowship and broke fellowship because they couldn't decide which side the piano would go on when they assembled the stage. Not important. It's not okay. on the left, it's not correct. Right. If it's not left, it's not right. Uh, anyway, so, uh, but the, it's not important. I've heard of churches that were fractured over carpet color in the sanctuary. I mean, just ridiculous nonsense. Things that are not important are not important. But yet we get so wound up in our own opinions and we feel like, well, my opinion's right, and so I have to be heard. And if, 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 we, if we do the carpet a different color, then I'm, then I'm not hurt. Well, I can't go there. Every time I walk in, I'm going to see that. She got her carpet choice, and I didn't get mine. <laughs> anyway, so it's, when it says be in agreement, it says that we're going to agree that we're really going to keep the important things the important things, and the things that aren't important aren't going to be important. The next point we want to make where it says, um, it says don't be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Don't be wise. Uh, do not be wise in your own estimation. Second point I want to make is to be humble, not self-important. Not self-important. Now, sometimes people talk because they want to be heard, and sometimes people talk because they want to hear themselves. You know what I'm saying? There's a, there's a difference there, right? There's a difference there. I got to admit, I will oftentimes fall on maybe not the right side of that. So, so God, as I'm preparing this message, is like, Kevin. And I'm like, I know. So, uh, you know, I work on that. I work on that. I don't have to always be heard. Sometimes I can be quiet. But be humble and not self-important really means what it says in Philippians chapter 2, which says, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Think about that for a minute. Jesus as God's son, God incarnate, equality with God, equal to God, could have easily used that to his own advantage. If suddenly you were elevated in position, often most of us, many of us would say, well, you know, it has its privileges, doesn't it? I get to do things that I didn't used to do, and we get really puffed up and proud. But Jesus did not do that, and so we are encouraged to make our own attitude like that of Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave or a servant, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. You know, how many of us think through our own attitude to be that of Christ. I gotta be honest, 
the majority of us, self-included, our thought process is all about me. Not, and you, you say me, I say me. You know, it's all about self. It's all about, yes, it's me, myself, and I. It's what is, how is this affecting me? What did they say to me? How, what, this traffic is bothering me. You know, all the things, it's usually about me. Instead of, an, uh, instead of a, this person in, that, that God is trusting me with, how am I loving them? What about them? But Jesus emptied himself of, of all of that pride and elevation of self and instead became like a servant, like a slave, the Bible says, and did not exercise his power for his own advantage, but instead sacrificed himself. Now, let me ask, let's put it in context. Do we have that same attitude at home? Do we have that same attitude at church? You see, churches don't split because everybody's serving one another. Churches split because, well, it's about me and how I was treated, right? Families don't split because they're serving one another. You're serving way too, I can't be around, you serve way too much. Nobody says that, right? Said no one ever. You're way too humble and way too loving and way too, you give and you give and you give and you never take. No one ever says that, right? It's not a thing. But are we here to be served or are we here to serve? No. What does this humility look like? How do we emulate the humility of Christ? Jesus said that he laid down his own life. No one took it from him. In other words, you know, when we imagine Christ being crucified, um, think of him going with a smile on his face, knowing what's happening. He could have stopped it at any point in time, even on the cross, he told the thief, I could at any point in time call, you know, thousands of angels to come take me off, you know, but he suffered it willingly because he, it was what he needed to do. That's humility. Sometimes we have to let go of things because taking up arms to defend ourselves does nothing but cause dissension. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes you need to let go of things because taking up arms to defend yourself might cause dissension. If we are in disagreement over something that is not essential to the kingdom of God, then being humble and letting the other person have their way or have their say is a good thing. Being humble is not defending your own preference, but letting the love of God keep you united instead. There is no reason to fight within ourselves over things that are less important than the relationships we have. Think back to that piano analogy Kevin gave. Was that really so important that it was worth splitting? The answer is no. Nothing is. Nothing is so important that it's worth dividing the body of Christ or your family or your, your faith family. Now think about the last argument that you had at home. Is whatever that was more important than the relationship that you have? Chances are No. You know, Patrice and I have talked a lot about, you know, former relationships and things like that and ridiculous fights. And, and truthfully, she and I do not argue with one another. It's just a thing that when we got married, we were like, life's too short. Let's, you know, let's do away with the idea that we always have to be right, either one of us. And let's just agree together. And it's been so great. <laughs> it's been really great. But you know what? There's been arguments over, why are you looking at me? You know, this is a previous relationship, and I'm like, okay. You know, and stuff like that, we're like, these things don't matter. Or the color of a couch, or, you know, things like that. It's just, what does it matter? What does it matter? But we what get movie so, are you watching? What movie are we going to watch? Where are we going to go? <laughs> no, don't even start with, where do you want to, where do you want to eat? Anywhere. Okay, how about here? No, not there. Okay. You know, all right, here we go. <laughs> That's a common one. Okay, so anyway. Um, but there's, there's. Really, we have to think, is my opinion more important than the person? If my opinion is more important than this person, then I need to adjust. I need to adjust my heart. Because I would suggest, if it's an opinion, and I don't mean factual about Christ, because God, God has said in his word that if you follow Christ, it can cause division in your family. They're not Christians. You're a Christian. You're going to go the way of the Lord, and, and, and people will oppose you for that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying if it's your opinion, is your opinion more important than the relationship? 
I mean, I would suggest never. Or else we're thinking of ourselves a little too highly, as the word says. Don't think of yourself too highly. Next point I want to make is, is that we're to, be, we're to be benevolent, not vindictive. Romans 12 says, do not repay evil for evil. Be benevolent, not vindictive. Someone offended you. And you know what we do? We say, I am now relieving myself of the responsibility to love that person because they did not treat me well. In fact, I'm going to treat them how they treated me so that they can understand. I'm going to teach them a lesson. They can understand how badly they hurt me. They need to hurt like I hurt. Now, we don't frame it like this. We don't put it in our mind. But we're like, well, they got what they deserve. From you? Yeah, from me. They did it to me. I do it back to them. They were wrong. I'm right. It's called we justify. We justify our behavior. I've brought justice into this situation. I am justified in treating this person poorly because they treated me poorly. Right? You guys are pretty quiet about this point right now, all right? I'm just saying, I'm seeing a lot of faces are like, (laughs) okay? But we do. We relieve ourselves of the responsibility to love that person because of how they treated us. And we are justified in our hearts now, we're wrong, but we, we justify it in our hearts because of how they treated us. And never at any point are we going to stand before God at judgment and he's going to say, yeah, yeah, you are fine there. You know, because I said, love your neighbor as yourself, except when they do all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? That's not, God never said that. And he will not, we will not suddenly be, you know, free from the responsibility of not loving someone because they treated us poorly. In fact, Jesus demonstrated the opposite. Guys, we cannot justify an unloving response because someone was unloving toward us. Ever. Ever. But we all do it. We all do it. I do it. I'm not proud of it. I try not to do it. I'm happy when I don't do it, but I've done it. Okay? I'm just as human as you guys are. Y'all know that, right? I don't have to keep saying this, right? I mean, y'all know. You know me. We get it. You're a mess. Okay, I understand. But the Bible tells us to be benevolent, not vindictive. It's very easy to get caught in the trap of they offended me so I can be offensive to them and I'm justified. I'm right. They're wrong. And that is not at all true. You cannot justify your behavior on what someone else has done. 1 Peter 3 says this. Now, finally, all of you should be like-minded and sympathetic should love believers and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called for this so that you can inherit a blessing. God blesses those who behave like Christ, who return in the face of insult a blessing instead. How many of us do that? Do we even know how to do that? Do we need to teach you how to do that? You know how to do it when you're not doing it? All right, fine. All right, it's on you then. I'm just saying. That's what God's called us to do, to not pay back evil for evil, but on the contrary, give a blessing instead because that's what we're called to. Let me put a picture in your head. Jesus on the cross, nails in his wrists and his feet, crown of thorns upon his head, whipped, beaten beyond imagining, being spit at, mocked, given wine with fecal matter, All of this and his response is what? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When should you forgive someone? After they hurt you? Or while they're hurting you? Maybe you shouldn't hold any grudge at all. Maybe you should have the mind of Christ in you so deep that you're unoffendable. It's unfathomable to forgive somebody while they're actively doing evil or every evil thing to you that you can imagine. Then to forgive them because you care about them. At the end of the day, the same Lord that loves you loves them too. He wants them to come into his presence and into his kingdom. So do not not get in the way with your petty pride or your ego. Do not be vindictive when you can be forgiving. It is better that you let it go 
and to bring them in than to hold on to something and push them away. You know, in 2 Peter verse 3, or chapter 9, verse 3, it says, The Look Lord does. Chapter 3, verse 9. Go ahead. Yeah. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what God's plan is for that person that just offended you? You know what God's plan is for that person that hurt you? His plan for them is the same as his plan for you to love you, to bring you into his family. Now, you can get in the way with this, with your pride or your ego. Maybe you should emulate Christ and be forgiving instead of vindictive. No one has ever seen Christ in your retaliation. But people do see Christ in your forgiveness. Right? No one's ever seen Christ when you've exacted your brand of justified, you know, retaliation. But they will see Christ through your love and forgiveness. All right, well, uh, last little bit here is simply this, okay? Uh, last two points. So it says, try to, do, try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Let's talk for a minute. It says, be honorable, not offensive. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. This is one of Paul's instructions that actually could be culturally subjective, but one we should always strive for. And what I mean by culture is subjective. We talked last week that there are some cultures where even doing something like this can be offensive. And if we are in a place where this is offensive, then I should maybe not do this. Oh, I have freedom in Christ. I'm an American. Okay, so what? You're being offensive. If you know, then don't. Even if you have the freedom to do so, even if this isn't a sin, then okay. But if you know that it's going to turn someone away, then don't do it. When I was in college, we would there was a cable access station. You know, go up to the higher end, you know, of cable and there was a cable access local channel and there was a pastor on there that uh, would preach messages filled I mean filled with profanity that was his bit his bit was he was going to sit there and cuss and we were little you know these little ministry students and we would tune in to be like what is he going to say and oh my stars he said that you know and we would sort of it was like the shock value for us that we watched it for the entertainment not because he had something to say but I will tell you this I can't remember a single thing. I learned zero from him because all I could hear was the profanity. And his point was, uh, it's just words. It shouldn't mean anything. I'm, I have freedom in Christ. I can say what I want. But I will tell you this. He offended a lot of people. And you know what? If I started just flying off the handle with swear words, you probably would be like, what has happened? Is he okay? Did he hit his head? We don't, you know, there would be, you, you would question and then you would probably be like, we can't be a part of this because all I hear is that. And that's all we heard. And this, um, this passage here is saying to try to be honorable in everyone's eyes. Let's not try to be offensive just because we have freedom in Christ to do what we want to do. If we know it's offending, then let's not offend. You know, some years ago, I helped a friend Be of mine real careful with this. plant a church. <laughs> and um, before we actually planted the church, we this went around and we visited a bunch of different churches to try to get a feel for the way different people did things. And we went to this church in Austin one time. And um, this, this gentleman who had planted this church in Austin, this was probably like his fifth or sixth church plant. So, you know, we were kind of going, get some experience, and we show up to this particular church and... It's in a house. It's a house church. And we walk in and, you know, introduce everybody. We sit down on the couches and he gets ready to preach a sermon. And he titles it WTF, not abbreviated. And so when he gives We don't have sermon, to go any further than that, right? You guys understand right, what he had written out in the thing? Okay, good. And so when he says this, immediately we're all like, what? Did he just... Okay, hold on. You know, and... To be honest with you, um, got nothing from it. Why? Because we're now so preoccupied with thinking about that little antic he used that we're not even listening to the sermon. You know, and not that I think that the use of certain words is um, intrinsically sinful, but the manner that you're behaving is dishonorable. You know. This passage in Romans is one of the only places in Scripture where social norms can actually play a part in the manner that you should behave. 
If you are willing to, if you're going to do what is honorable in other people's eyes, and this requires you to do what they find honorable, not necessarily what you think is honorable in and of yourself. So long as I'm not compromising the truth, then maybe my behavior should reflect uh, what other people find honorable. Now, for this matter, what is honor? This is not a word we use very commonly anymore. We don't have a sense of honor um, like society used to. Honor is a vague, abstract idea in our modern society, but it was essential in the ancient world. Honor was so important the soldiers died for it. Samurai committed seppuku for honor. Even in the military, honor doesn't even mean what it used to. Modern soldiers, they don't go to war for honor. If you talk to them and you really talk to them, they'll tell you what they fought for was each other. They were trying to make sure that they made it home, but they didn't join the military for honor the way people did back in the 40s. It wasn't about honor. Um, but here's the point. If I am a dishonorable person, if I am not trustworthy, if I am not honorable, then it's going to get in the way of me sharing the gospel. If I'm a scoundrel, even if I'm forgiven of my sins, but I'm a scoundrel and I start telling people about Jesus, are they even listening? So the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, so if anyone purifies himself from anything dishonorable, he will be a special instrument set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. And so the Bible tells us here that I need to live a life that is honorable, that when people see it, they'll say, you know what? I do see Christ in him. And even though I'm forgiven from sin, I don't want to live a life filled with sin so that I can be forgiven. I want to live an honorable life. And so that's what the Bible is speaking here in Romans chapter 12. So let's live in such a way that our message of love is reflected in our behavior. I love you enough to adjust my behavior so that I'm not offending you, right? I don't need to be offensive. I need to be honorable. And the last thing I want to say is, is we need to be peaceful, not combative. Be peaceful, not combative. Because it says, if possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. If possible on your part simply means, look, somebody may come against you and you're like, there is no peace to be had here. You know, the lady that I mentioned at the very first, I, there was nothing, nothing I could do to continue. And I could spend all day long trying to make her happy and I'd never make her happy. She'd always find something else. But as, as long as it's possible on you, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, Therefore I, the prisoner for the Lord, this is Paul writing, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. That was uh, the first three verses. Chap uh, verse 25 says this, Since you've put away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. So here's the point. The point is simply this, that because we're all members together, we're members of one body, your family, same, all right? You've decided that we are going to be a family. And we, in this room, have decided we're going to be a, a family. So as a family... As far as it depends on us, each other, let's live at peace together. Isn't it better when there is peace than when there's conflict? Do you know, I mean, if you're running toward conflict because you're like, yeah, let's do this. I'm ready to fight. Mm, settle down. A very few times people run towards conflict. In fact, and this is next week's message, what do people typically do when there is conflict? Go the other way. When there's personal conflict, well, I can't be around them. They don't fix it. They forget it. And it's not fixed. And I would suggest that probably each of us have at least some relationships that are broken in our wake as we've passed by and there's been conflict and we've not ever gone back and rectified that, changed that, fixed that. Some, even in our own families or extended families, even right now. And there are some churches that are like that, where there are bodies everywhere, broken, bleeding, hurt, because there have been people that have like, you know what, we're not going to fix this. And that is not scriptural. We are members of, of one body. So with all humility and gentleness, with patience, we accept one another in love, and we keep the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. 
Have you ever been a part of a church that calls everybody brother? You know what I'm saying? Like, like not, it's like brother followed by the name. Have you ever been there? Or sister, the, you brother know, Kevin. like, yeah, brother Kevin or brother Quincy. Have you ever been to those churches before? I see some faces with some wrinkled noses. And so I grew up in a church that was like, and, and, and so my dad was a deacon and he was brother Don and we'd be walking through his kids. I was never brother nothing because I was this big. But, you know, uh, but walking through and we'd hear, hey, brother Don, hey, brother Jim, or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, so they're brother this and brother that and sister this and sister that. And I'm honest when I would say as a kid, I was like, I don't get it. That is a weird. <laughs> it feels kind of culty, you know, like we're, <laughs> what's happening here? Are we all going to live in the mountains? What are we doing? I, it just, it felt, it felt kind of cultish. In that it wasn't, it was a normal church, but that's how they talked back then. I'm not proposing we go there, all right? I'm not. Why not, Brother Kevin? Because <laughs> it's weird. Because <laughs> I, I just don't talk like that. But you grew up in a church that was like that, right? Yeah, you know, I actually still have people that I still refer to as Brother John, Brother C, Brother Gerald, you know. But the thing is, is I don't think it's genuine anymore. If we truly thought of each other like brother and sister, we truly thought of each self, each other like members of one another, there'd be no splits, there'd be no division. You know, I have one biological brother, and we don't always talk every day, um, but there's nothing that would ever break that. You know, we've gotten knocked down, drag out fist fights, and guess what? I'll still be at his house all the time. You know, every time there's Mother's Day, we're there, we're, we're talking, we text back and forth. You know, but that's the thing. That's what it's like when you truly think of each other like brother and sister. If I truly thought of each and every one of you in here like my brother or my sister, there'd be nothing that could divide us. There'd be nothing to separate us. And that's the way Scripture wants us to, to think about each other. That's the way we're called to be. We are brothers in Christ. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, and when you have a disagreement with your brother or your sister, they're still your brother. They're still your sister. You may as well chop your own arm off as opposed to lose fellowship with them. You know, um, if you have a family and you get in a fight with them, you don't really disappear. You might disappear for a little while. You might let things cool down, but they're still your family. You're still going to see them at the next family reunion. You're still going to talk to them. You don't run away and you don't let things dissolve. I mean, that's the hope. But the problem is in our society, we've given freedom to the idea that you can just separate yourself and it's okay. It's not okay. Right. So like even if in a family, you know, if if me and a, my brother get in a fight, guess what? There's still other people in the family. They're going to try to bring us back together and it'll get there eventually. Because that's the way we're supposed to be. That's the way the church was designed. It was designed that we would all be brothers and sisters. Proverbs 1911 says a person's insight gives him patience and his virtue is to overlook offense. Understanding, real understanding, requires me to understand the position of those I disagree with. If we are having an argument, then in order for me to truly be patient with you, even when I am right, I have to try to understand where you're coming from. And I've never been wrong. Uh -huh. <laughs> but that's the thing. If, we're, if we have a disagreement, then I need to try to understand where you come from. That's a virtue. A virtue is going to look over that offense. And if I understand that you're coming from a position of pain and the way that you're lashing out, the way that you're behaving is really because there's something else that's causing this, then it's easier to overlook. If you're technically wrong, it's easier to fix. But I have to understand why you're wrong. And if I'm wrong, I want you to understand and be gracious with me. I have to listen to you and be patient with you in order to work with you. It is a virtue for me to be able to overlook your failures, and I pray that you have this virtue with me when I fail. Let me wrap it up by saying this. Satan wants to wreck your family. Satan wants to wreck your relationships. Satan wants to wreck your church because that's what he does. And he uses offense so many times to cause people to leave relationships. And it can be little things that over time compile because we don't communicate. We're finally like, fine, I'm done. Or it can be big things that we refuse to demonstrate understanding. We bring all our pride into that situation and go, this is about me, how you treated me. 
And we're not talking about being doormats here. We're talking about we communicate and we work it out and we do what we need to do in order to, because the relationship is more important. The relationship is the most important. Satan does have a plan for the church, for your family, for your life. If he can isolate you, if he can separate you from others, if he can uh, create this, you know, this idea of you're not loved, you're not cared for, you're not important. If he can cause you to be easily offended to where you're like, I can't believe the people around me are like this, and you show zero understanding, then yeah, he wins. But God is a God of, re- of relationships. God is a God who delights in restoration. When I seek to restore a relationship, I'm moving the direction that God moves throughout humanity. He reconciles and he restores. He loves enough to be, uh, for us to be uncomfortable. We leave because we're uncomfortable. We need to get over it. So let's not let Satan win. When we talk about our church, when we talk about our family, let's recognize God's plan. Offense will happen. We said that last week. (laughs) It's going to happen. Are we heart prepared to be like Christ when it does? Father, thank you for today, for this opportunity to learn through your word, for Romans chapter 12, which is clear when it tells us not to be pride-filled, but instead be humble, when it demonstrates how we should serve one another and love one another, that we should not be easily offended, but rather, and God, we should seek to serve one another instead. So help us as we walk from this place to be filled with loving kindness, that your spirit would fill us, that as you trust other people in front of us, that as you bring people into our lives, that we can love them the way you've called us to with the love of Christ. God, I pray that you remove an easily offended spirit from within us, but rather give us a spirit of understanding, one that sees the person in front of us as valued in the kingdom, that we can love them, that we can forgive them, that we can leave our own opinions and how great we are behind us and care for that person. And Lord, for those who have been wounded and hurt by church or who have been wounded or hurt by family or by relationships, Lord, I pray especially for them right now. God, I pray that you would, by your spirit, just bring about the warmth of your healing presence God, they would understand that you do not want to leave them broken or wounded. But rather, God, you bind those wounds. That they do not have to stay in that place. That you have a plan for their family. You have a plan for their faith family. And you desire to do good things in them and with them and through them. And so, Lord, we turn those wounds of offense over to you. Lord, we pray that you would teach us how to forgive and move on and heal and grow. We love you, God. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.